That's what you have to choose. It's not a question of what are you gonna achieve right now, this week, this month, this year, but in two years, three years, five years, in 10 years. It's up to you. You can do it. You have the tools. You have the opportunity. Do it. Welcome everyone back to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We are back once again, still here in Dubai, and we're still the number one trading podcast in the world, the fastest growing thanks to all of you and our incredible guests. Talking of which, we have an absolute OG in the game. The original online trader, the original person to showcase what trading can do. This is Timothy Sykes. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I want to say, do I call you Tim, Timothy? What do you prefer? Tim is fine. Tim, yeah. I'm only Timothy online because some bastard owned timsykes.com <laughs> when I first started and I couldn't get it. And he really? wanted like $50,000. And I was like, I'm not paying 50000 for my own name. I don't negotiate with terrorists. Right? <laughs> One time, I think like five or six years later, he forgot to renew it. And I got like a Google alert really? in the middle of the night. And it was like, timsykes.com has become available. So I'm like, I'm, I'm back. But by that time, everyone already knew me as Timothy. So I have like timothysykes.com, timsykes.com. It's... Everyone calls me Timothy, like, but it's like only my mom calls me Timothy. It's, <laughs> it's really messed up. I can imagine. But I got TimSykes.com. I'm back. You got it anyway. Yeah? Eventually. I love that. And, you know, you've been renowned in the industry overall, in the finance industry, in the trading industry. You know, you've been around for a very long time, you know, before a lot of this social media sort of trading space really came around. And I'm sure that's so much insights that people can get from you. In regards to that, like, what are your thoughts in terms of what the industry looks like now compared to when you first started? Um, I mean, still, you have like 90% of traders losing. So it's still mm. an industry full of losers, degenerate gamblers looking for picks, hot picks. Mm -hmm. And I've always been trying to focus on teaching rules in the process. Even from the get-go, I was like, wait a minute, like... It's all about rules. It's all about discipline. How do I, you know, get that through to people? Mm -hmm. But people don't want to learn. They want hot picks. They just want to like, yeah, yeah, you, you've made millions in the market. How do I like do that too? So I'm like, okay, let me think about it backwards. So when I first began teaching 15 years ago, which is crazy now, I was like, okay, I want to teach rules, but no one really cares about the rules. How do I actually get them to care? Oh, you show what money can buy. So back then I had like, you know, cars and like I would post all this cash and stuff. I was like the original douchebag. You said it in a nice way. You're like the OG. Yeah. I was the original douchebag. Mm -hmm. Business Week used douchebag in the title first time with me. Okay? Really? Wow. So I accepted that in order to teach rules. I didn't care. Like I don't, I have thick skin. I've been on reality shows. I look like a douchebag sometimes with the <laughs> stuff I say. I, it just, you know, spurts out. But for me, if I can get you thinking, how do you actually get this money? Because I'm from a small town in Connecticut, didn't grow up with much money, always wanted to travel the world. So I was like, okay, I'll teach the rules in the process, but to get people to actually study, I have to show off like the lifestyle. Mm. In trading, as you know, the lifestyle is amazing. Like we should show it off. People just don't want to show it off because they're, they're too afraid of looking like a jerk, mm. right? I've accepted that I look like a jerk and I show off the lifestyle. I don't post cash or cars anymore. I actually sold all my cars. I got into charity. So now my engagement is crap, but I'm happier. Yeah. Well, that's, well, there's a lot to unpack there, but yeah. essentially you're like the anti-guru in terms of like being, showing like a guru in terms of everything, in terms of lifestyle, et cetera, but then actually giving the value that is necessary to make that happen. You got to back it up. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people in trading and online where they just show the lifestyle and you're like basically like what? Like a rapper. But most rappers are broke too, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's it's crazy. Everyone like sells the lifestyle, but they got nothing behind it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are influenced by the lifestyle. So for me, I want to show off the lifestyle, but I earned it. Now, frankly, I don't make any money from trading anymore because I donate all my trading profits to charity. My charity has grown now. We've donated $10 million in six years. Wow. Um, 120 schools, 13 homes, two recycling centers, helping animal centers all over the world. But for me, I needed to show the lifestyle first. So I encourage everyone to post honestly about your lifestyle. Don't exaggerate. Don't like, you know, try to like rent a car for a day or something like that. But at the same time, back it up with your wisdom and then you get both and that that's how you grow a brand 
Absolutely incredible. And you mentioned starting teaching 15 years ago. How, how many years were you trading before that? Um, roughly uh, 10 years. So it's been like 25 years. Yeah. Some of, I have like millionaire students who are less than 25 years old. Like some people say like, I've been trading since you were in diapers. Like I was trading before they were like even little embryos. Wow. And now they're, you know, a lot of my millionaire students are 24, 25, 26. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. It really is. And you're in the penny stocks world, right? So yes. that's the side of trading that you focus on. Yeah. Can you tell us a, a difference between the penny stock side versus, because you'd be probably one of the first traders I've had on who's primarily just penny stocks. I've had people on who started there, maybe transitioned to options yeah. or futures. So you know, can you give us a bit of insights into the difference of being a penny stock trader versus say, you know, Forex options and so on. Yeah, so Forex options, huge markets, infinite liquidity. You have like five to one, 10 to one, 100 to one leverage. Penny stocks is like this small little pond versus the ocean that is the rest of Wall Street and finance. Most people start with penny stocks or something like very small, but then they're like, no, there's not that much money here. Let me move into something bigger. I've always stayed in my small pond. Um, I've now made roughly $7.6 million over you know 20 plus years, so not very much. There are some traders who make 7.6 million in one day, mm. um, but my average trading profit is roughly $1,500. So I'm taking small trades on small stocks, and frankly, it still adds up. And I like it because I think that there's better advantage, better odds in this small pond. Cause I know everything. Like I know the promoters, I know which are, are scams. I know, you know, if, if a play is going to ride, um, the hype for like three, four, five, six, seven, seven days, sometimes 10 days. Um, it's very, you know, repetitive. Mm -hmm. it, you get a hot trend, you get some like hot sector versus Forex options, big companies. I don't, I don't know that stuff. Like it's, I don't think it's as predictable although there is much more money. So like it's it's just apples and oranges. Hmm. And with that then, so you made 7.6 million in that 25 year span, you know, and as you say, like some people may consider that low, there's still obviously a huge amount that a lot of people in their lifetime would see. And you can live really well hmm. with just a few million dollars. This hmm. is what people don't understand. They want a billion dollars, hmm. but the stress, the competition, the odds of making a billion are, it's just not worth it for me. I live a great life with just a few million in the bank. Do you feel like that is a misconception that people have is that they're constantly chasing these hundreds of millions and like it's good to obviously have goals but do you feel like most people put themselves at a disadvantage having wild goals that they don't truly understand how attainable that is or what it takes to get to that level 100 percent. that's the problem like you're you're it's basically like the lotto mentality you buy like a lotto ticket your odds are like one in what 200 million or something but everyone wants it like what if i win the lotto most lotto winners actually go broke mm -hmm. in case you don't know like they they don't have financial lessons they're not disciplined for me i'm taking like the low hanging fruit when i make 1500 dollars on a penny stock trade it's i don't want to say it's easy because like it's not i still lose like a third of the time but it's easier because of my experience because mm -hmm. of my know-how and because of the small niche that I'm in. Mm -hmm. So it's just understanding what you're good at. I'm not that smart. I'm not that good at math. So I've tried to venture into bigger stuff and then I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa this moves too fast. This is scary. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to venture into something bigger, but then I just accepted my fate. I'm like a, you know, a vampire trader <laughs> who's like, you know, did you ever see, um, was it interview with a vampire with Tom Cruise and Brad movie, Pitt? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they bite Kirsten Dunst and she's this little girl and she has to stay a little girl forever. Mm -hmm. And she's like bitter and she's all messed up in the head because she's a little girl. That's me. I'm like a little girl in trading. I'm like a little, <laughs> I've, I've been bitten by the penny stock vampire bug and I'm forced to like stay because I just know it so well. And again, even though I lose a third of the time, my losses are smaller than my wins. Mm -hmm. And I, I can do it with much less stress. Mm -hmm. I know many traders who make much more than me, but they're so stressed. They want to make enough to quit. Like they can't wait to get out, but they're addicted. And so it's like this constant struggle with them. For me, I love trading small stocks. I love exposing scams. I love um, donating my trading profits to charity. I love teaching. So I've created a life in this little niche that I'm really happy with. And I think that's what people should be focused on, not just the money. But it's always messed up when you talk about money because people just want a lot of money. Like, yeah, 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 Tim, shut up. Give me a hot pick. And I'm like, no, these lessons matter. So you have to kind of separate you, you have to get very introspective. You have to separate what makes you happiest versus what you're capable of too. Most people watching this 
are not that smart. Most people watching this are not that good at math. Most people watching this, it doesn't matter if you want a hundred million or a billion, you're not gonna get it. And if you try, you'll probably just lose all your money like most traders. It's a sobering reality, no doubt. But one thing you did touch on there, which I think is important is understanding one experience and understanding what you're good at. So do you feel like if most people could really just double down on what they're good at, the, whichever side of the industry it is, even if it's not trading, even if it's something else, yeah. but if they just really truly understand themselves, understand what they're good at, what they understand, where their tolerance for risk versus stress levels is, like the, where that nice balance is, and they just stuck to that, they would see much more success. Yeah, you have to find what you're good at too. Like I didn't know when I first started that I was going to be teaching. If you had told me that I was going to teach and donate all my trading profits to charity, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, no, I want to get rich. I want to get out of my small town. So you have to recognize what you're good at, but you have to recognize who you are and you learn who you are and you learn what you're good at. So I encourage everyone to try different niches and test and see. And, you know, maybe you are smart. Like there are some people, it's not like no one makes money from trading. Um, there are bigger opportunities out there. I think you have to very uh, be, you, you have to be very honest with yourself. You have to just be blunt about what you're good at and what you're bad at. What are your weaknesses? My weakness is I'm totally impatient. So I'm not good. Like some of my top students make fun of me because they hold this, we're trading the same stocks and they're holding for a week, two weeks, three weeks. And I take my 10% profit and they're up like 200% over two weeks. And I'm like, God bless you. I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. My best strategy is holding a stock over the weekend, buying on a Friday and selling on a Monday. The only reason why I hold is because the weekend, the stock market is closed. Mm -hmm. That's it. So I've learned what I'm good at and what I'm bad at and what I really enjoy. And you can make the markets work for you. This is the thing. People, again, only focus on how much money they can make. You have to stop thinking about that. We're going to live long lives, right? So any money that you make in year one, year two, year three, it's probably going to be negligible in the long run. But you have to kind of craft your own journey. So I say try every strategy, but then eventually find what really like hits you and, and feels right. In terms of you starting out, like what was your mindset? Was your mindset at that time that you wanted to make you know, tens of millions and million dollars in your trades, et cetera? Or were you always sort of content with, like, I'm gonna just do this small and steady? Or was that sort of a realization that came later? Yeah, I was never content in the beginning. Like, I mean, I got started in 1998, 1999, stock market bubble. So I was right place, right time. I made nearly a million dollars um, senior year of high school and freshman year of college. Wow. So I was like, I'm extrapolating. I'm like, well, if I make 700,000 every six months and then I bet bigger, I'll be a billionaire in 18.4. Like I was an idiot. Mm -hmm. um, you also don't know that there's different market cycles. So it's not just what works for you. It's what is working in the current market. Right now we're filming this the markets are hitting high. Cryptos are hitting highs, US stocks hitting highs, even Japan is hitting highs after 30 plus years. So we're in a really bull market. A lot of people think that they're smarter than they are. They're like, yeah, I'm getting this, this is easy. But a lot of it is just due to being in the right place. If we're talking in 2022, which was terrible on pretty much every front, People are like, oh my God, I hate trading. I suck at this. This is terrible. But it's the market. You mm -hmm. could be amazing at trading, but if the market is bad, it doesn't matter. So for me, I really encourage people to be in this for the long run. I say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and you start to learn, can you profit in bull markets? Can you profit in bear markets? Can you be okay with not having big years? Um, you really learn a lot the longer you're in this. How many years have you been trading? Nine years. This right? has been coming into my ninth year. And you're learning some very valuable lessons right now, mm -hmm. right? I had my biggest loss year eight. I mm -hmm. had no risk management, no discipline for eight years. I just like, oh, this is so easy. And then it takes a big loss to really, you know, wake you up and smack you. Mm -hmm. If you ever get too cocky, the market will humble you. It's kind of like, it sucks, but it's kind of nice to know that there's like consequences. Yeah. You know, there's justice in the market. Definitely. And in terms of that, that big loss, what was it? Well, how much was that? That sort of loss? So roughly, a, roughly a million dollars at wow. the time where I was running a hedge fund is roughly a third of my hedge fund. Um, but at the time, as a hedge fund manager, the rules were you weren't allowed to discuss uh, performance publicly. Mm -hmm. So I had this big loss and I couldn't talk about it. And I had previous big wins and I couldn't talk about it. And I was so frustrated. And then I was on this TV show called Wall Street Warriors oh. right as this was all airing. So I was drunk in every episode of Wall Street Warriors. And right. that made me funnier because most people are like boring and tight lipped. And I was like, ah, oh, let me just get drunk. And, uh, you know, it was all on TV and that became like a hit. That's what led me into teaching. 
So it's very crazy where I couldn't talk about my big wins. I couldn't talk about my big losses. Let's just get drunk and film a reality show. <laughs> Talking of which, in terms of the reality shows, like you've done quite a few. You know, what was the, was it because like, let's say like social media wasn't around really then. Was that that version of social media? That was like sort of the PR, the press and sort of getting out there a bit more? Yeah. I mean, I was really annoyed with the hedge fund rules. Like I was trying to raise money, but I didn't know rich people. Um, you had to have like a pre-existing relationship with wealthy people. And I'm like, I don't have any pre-existing relationships. I'm from this small town. I have this kind of humor that's not ideally geared towards the richest people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, let me just be on this reality show. My lawyers, everyone in the hedge fund industry, are like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you doing? Like, this is going to ruin you. And I'm like, well, I only had like a $3 million fund, um, you know, with a million dollar loss. It wiped out basically three years of previous gains. I was still wow. up, but mm -hmm. like, just a really nasty uh, thing. I believed in a company. I believed in this company called Cygnus E-Transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically invented printed home ticketing. So I was right about the technology, wrong about the company. They went bankrupt. Later, the CEO, who literally I was sitting with him like this, mm -hmm. um, and as the company was going under, he's like, don't worry, Tim. We're a good company. We are good technology. You've invested well. Two weeks later, they declared bankruptcy. Uh, a few months later, he secretly, and I didn't know this at the time, he secretly bought the company for himself in bankruptcy, wiped out all the shareholders and debt holders, and kept all the contracts. They had printed home ticketing with like uh, Disney and like Universal Studios, and he acquired it for himself, later sold the company for you know over 100 plus million. But he looked at me like this, and he's like, don't worry, the company is fine. Then bankruptcy. Then he, then he bought it for himself. Like, great lessons you can't trust anybody yeah. he was looking at me like this this same level i still remember this stephen k brown i still remember his name i remember that initial mm. stephen k right and it was just shocking to me that somebody would lie to my face it was my fault you know i'm a shareholder i have no rights what is that do you think because obviously I'm go i've gone through that before and going through something very similar at the moment and what do you feel like that is in terms of like the trust, like why, why is it do you feel like people trust very easily or trust people at their word? Let's take a break for a minute there guys because I want to tell you about the best trading tool on the market, TradeZella. The reason why TradeZella is the number one trading tool that every trader needs is because you can do backtesting, automated journaling, trade replay, in-depth analytics and so much more. And the greatest part about TradeZella is that it's all automated. All you have to do is connect your MT4 and MT5. It will pull all your data onto the dashboard. You can add playbooks. You can just add notes. You can add images from your trades and you can get the insights that is necessary for you to progress as a trader. Now, TradeZella is for absolutely everyone whether you're a crypto trader, whether you're a Forex trader, whether you trade prop firms, it is for absolutely everyone. And that is why thousands of traders have signed up using my link here through the podcast. Make sure you use the code RIZ10 for 10% off your monthly subscription or WOR for 20% off your yearly subscription. The link is in the description below. And let's get back to the episode. I mean, you want to believe people are good inherently, right? But unfortunately, when it comes to money and business, I mean, it's vultures, right? Yeah. Like it's, that's the game. For me, I've never invested big into another company. I've never believed anybody after that loss. Um, like I said, like the hedge fund finished up 2% per year over four years, but that's terrible. I closed it down because I was like, this isn't even worth it for me to do this. Like, you know, why do this? And the reality show was taking off and got me into teaching. So. It all helped me eventually, but you really have to learn. Do not trust anybody. Do not believe anybody. If someone says, oh, here's a statement, back it up. Let me see documents. Let me see facts. Because you just, like, some people are very charismatic and you want to believe them, mm -hmm. you know? And they know where they can, like, kind of, like, massage the truth. And you're like, you can't believe anything. So I just, I trust nobody right now. It's a sad thing to be, but that's the only way to protect yourself. With penny stocks, it helps because there are so many scams. Most people in penny stocks are just morons. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm dealing with promoters like where 
they're pretending to be successful. And then you're like, no, look at the SEC filings. Look at like the company headquarters. I've exposed penny stocks where like they're based out of like a, a UPS box. Like they just have a PO box. They don't yeah. have an actual headquarters. There was one company, they were based out of a barn. I Google mapped them and it's literally like you can see the barn. And I was like, are you, like this is the dumbest thing ever. Most people in penny stocks are not that smart. Like mm -hmm. Wolf of Wall Street made penny stocks famous for scamming, mm -hmm. but that was pre-internet. You like people would just get called by the Wolf of Wall Street and you know Stratton Oakmont. Yeah. They couldn't research. Now you can research. So you have to really be cynical and research everything. Don't ever feel like you're asking too many questions, like you're being impolite. You have to believe the worst and you'll never be disappointed. That's what I say. I understand it now. Cause I feel like you know that like you said in terms of vultures and, and people being like that in business. Do you feel like to get to those levels in business, you know, the millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, do you just feel like that's what it takes? Like, because I hear people say you need to be ruthless in business. And I've always, I understand it, I do. But I just feel like from what I've observed so far, those people doing that, when, I, when they say ruthless, they mean like these sort of things where they're kind of doing people over or yeah. not being truthful. They're doing, not like maybe dishonest things, but they're just being very aggressive and cutting down anyone in their way so that they become successful. And I don't know if that's something that I would want to do to get to that level of success. That's the thing. Like, I'm sure there are some good people who are, you know, very competent and very meticulous, not necessarily ruthless or unethical. I'm sure there's some people like that. I just don't know. I've never, mm -hmm. after that big loss, I've never invested in a company so much and believed in a company. Now I just trade. Yeah. That's the beauty of trading. You don't, you don't have to like believe anything. I just always expect the worst. If I'm in a penny stock, I expect it's a scam. I expect the worst and that way I'm literally never disappointed. If they get like busted later, I'm like, well, that's what I anticipated. So it prevents me from making too much money because I, I don't stay in anything long enough. But at the same time, it keeps me safer. So you have to choose like what kind of existence you want. Mm -hmm. If you invest, you believe, you invest your time, your money, your you know dreams, you can get heartbroken. That's why you have to be meticulous. So there's, there's nothing... Uh, there's no way around being extra meticulous. Yeah. So whether you think someone's a scam, whether you think you just want to like triple check everything, that's what you have to do. You just can't believe anybody in this industry. Remember, 90% plus of traders lose, okay? CNBC makes like a million dollars a day in ads, but what is the average viewer actually doing? Are they benefiting or they're just watching entertainment? Because hmm. they have a funny bald guy saying bye, 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 <laughs> right? Like it's, it's a sad industry mm -hmm. with how many people lose mm -hmm. and they don't want to talk about it too. It's very interesting you say that because I got a chance to go to Wall Street. Um, when was it? It was in November of last year. And of course, back in the day, Wall Street, you know, there were actual traders, the trades were taking place. But now from when I went there, it was literally like 50, 60% of it were sets like t for TV shows and for, for news stations, etc. And it just seemed like you know, like it's just become a content station more than anything, which is so, it was so interesting to see. Like I wouldn't say it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing necessarily, but it was like, it was just so interesting because it's like, this is where everyone thinks and everyone says, I want to be a Wall Street trader. I want to be like Wall Street. Wall Street's like up there on a pedestal. I went there and it was literally just loads of different sets. And uh, I just found it fascinating. Like, what are you, have you been there? Have you, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I've rung the bell. I've been to the bull. I've been on CNBC a lot. Um, you know, I, I think Wall Street becomes Hollywood. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even when I was on CNBC, like they powdered me up. I was like orange, like <laughs> look like a freaking Oompa Loompa. <laughs> but like it's entertainment. So you have to separate entertainment versus actual education. Mm -hmm. And it sucks. It's sad that, that that's what Wall Street has become. That's what CNBC, that's what the industry has become. But it's also good because it means you don't have to go to Wall Street. You can do this from anywhere. Someone watching this in, you know, Bangalore, someone watching this in Botswana, someone watching watching this in Greece, you can literally do anything from the comfort of your own home. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of misconceptions about what Wall Street is, but the world is much more open and there's no barriers to entry. And this is the beautiful thing now with the internet, you can research everything, you have all the tools. So it's sad, but it's also endlessly, you know, 
promising if people take advantage of the tools that they have. We just need to get people to actually take advantage. Like, love your YouTube shows, love your interviews, love your transparency. We need more of that. People say like, oh, I, don't, I shouldn't look at my phone so much. I shouldn't use social media so much. Yes, you should. You should use it so much more. We're just beginning of this information revolution. The old world is dying. It's becoming sets, right? Mm -hmm. It's like kind of like, have you been to Venice, Italy? Yeah, uh, right? not Venice. Not Venice. So Venice yeah. used to be the most powerful city in the world wow. with all the ships and everything. But then ships got too big. They're little canals. What is it now? It's just trinkets and tourists. It's fun to go to Venice. It's not the most powerful city in the world. It's actually sinking. It's like yeah, dying. But this is several hundred years later, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you could say like the Spanish Empire. Like it, it's good to look at history. And you see that a lot of like the biggest meccas in the world for business they die out and eventually they just become tourist attractions. That's what Wall Street is basically becoming. This is a whole revolution and we're just at the beginning of it. So I agree that you shouldn't use social media to like watch cat videos or something like that, but you should use social media in the internet as a tool to develop yourself and learn everything. Mm -hmm. It's not just about trading. You can learn whatever you want. You know, what if you love violin? You can watch tens of thousands of videos of violin and instructional videos and performances that inspire you. It's pretty amazing how much information is being shared, but people really need to consume it. And that was me sitting in Orange, Connecticut when the internet was first starting. I mean, I was there with like dial-up modems. Were mm -hmm. you there for dial-up yeah, modems? I right? It was like, choo, choo, choo. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the information revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's still, you know, the internet's only like 30, 35 years old. Like it's, it's small. It's, yeah. it's just beginning. So I'm excited for the next five, 10, 20 years. I'm excited for people watching this and opening their minds like, Oh, I don't have to go to wall street. Oh, I don't need billions of dollars. Oh, I can do anything. So you can live your life in the real world, but you should really focus on your studies. It's so true because of, like knowledge has always been interestingly more available now, but then people are consuming probably most of the wrong stuff now. Therefore, I don't want to say that people are getting stupider, for example, or, or not as smart now, probably at the same line, but they're not, they could easily be here because of the access to information. Like before it was either blocked, like people talk about universities, for example, and like, you know, having to pay for them, et cetera. At one point, universities were only for the elite, only for those super rich people. And like, there was no chance of higher education. And then look at where we are now. Like edu yeah, universities is open to anyone. Of course, there's a price tag a lot of the time as well. But then even with libraries, for example, knowledge, it was always in the books. So you'd have to try and get access to these books, libraries, now everything. All of that information, even the university that I paid 10K a year for, for example, is on the phones, is on online for free. And it's absolutely insane. And I think a lot of the time we do sort of lose sight of it. I feel like because of Netflix and the social media and all the different elements of the world that is thrown at us, we just get distracted. You have to curate your time because one thing we're all running out of is time, right? There's a, there's a ticking clock for all of us depending on where we are in our lifestyle and stuff. But you need to really try to maximize your time to maximize your life as soon as possible. So if you want to get rich, you got to start studying as soon as possible. You don't, you can't be like, oh, New Year's resolution, Jan I'll wait till January. No, like right now, everyone's playing a game of catch up, okay? You have to look at history. A few centuries ago, the smartest person in your village was somebody who might have read one book. Mm -hmm. almost everyone else was illiterate and that one book could have been like a fictional story, but that still would have been the smartest person in the village. You weren't able to talk to somebody in another country. If you wanted to visit two villages over, it would take three days or a week. So like now we can go everywhere, right? Like right now we're in Dubai. The other day I was in Miami. I'm heading to Bali. I'm heading to Japan, India, uh, Thailand, then over to Vegas, then over to Italy. That's my next month. People who did that centuries ago. I mean, that, that's your entire lifetime, yeah. right? Maybe if you're lucky, you get to visit. I've been to over a hundred countries. So I'm maximizing my time. I'm very aware of trying to capitalize on the opportunity that we have. You know, in the past, forget about just one book, parents' dreams were to send their kids to college. Mm -hmm. Colleges did the best marketing in the world. Like send your kid to college, get a good job. Now you send a kid to a college, they're probably in debt for five or 10 years, not guaranteed a good job, learning the same education as everyone else. You're just a little cog in the wheel in the rat race and you've been sold a lie. I don't think you need to go to university. Maybe you have to be like a doctor or a lawyer, you know, you have advanced degrees, but most of the things you can learn are online mm -hmm. and they're very small 
investments money wise, but very big investments time wise. So again, like you can't just look at money. This is the problem with money. People don't understand money. They're like, oh, Netflix is so cheap, $10, $20 a month. That's great. But it's also robbing you of your time. Mm -hmm. It might cost a little in terms of money, but it's a huge amount of your life, a huge amount of time. And you don't realize that. I would not trade my time for money. If Netflix, even let's say they said, uh, they came up with like an ad model and they said, we'll pay you $20 a month. So many people will be like, I'm getting paid. I'm watching Netflix. This is amazing. And you're wasting your life away. You're wasting your time. And Netflix is laughing at you. Netflix makes billions. They don't care whether they get your 10 or $20 or they pay you 10 or $20. You're just part of the millions who subscribe. So every single person watching this should think, okay, how do I maximize every single day? Mm -hmm. Every single day you have an opportunity to learn. And the most learning that you can do takes many months or years. Like I have 40 millionaire students now. None of them made much or anything in year one or even year two. It's really year three, year four, year five after you put in the foundation of learning. So everyone has to put in the foundation of learning. Very few people are willing to do that. You're not willing to sacrifice your short-term fun. You're just like, ah, shut up, Tim. Stop, stop making me study. I just want to invest in index funds. Make your eight to 10% per year. Go nowhere in life. That's, that's up to you. But if you want to really maximize your life, you sacrifice time and money into your education. And then that pays off in the long run. 40 millionaire students. I'm sure you've obviously taught a lot more people over the years. Thousands. Exactly. And, and what would you say separates those 40 compared to everyone else? Work ethic, determination, perspective, right? Very similar statistics with the gym industry. Guess what percent of people have a gym membership and don't go to the gym? What do you think? Well, me. <laughs> Probably 90%, 95%. Correct. Different studies say 90 to 95%. Very similar with my subscriptions. People pay for the subscriptions. They don't watch the video lessons. They're like, yeah, yeah, I, just, I, I know I want to get like financially proficient. How are you going to get financially proficient if you don't study? Yeah, yeah, Tim, just give me a hot pick, then I'll study. No, no, it doesn't work like that, okay? Hot picks, it's, it's a myth. You need to know how to plan a trade. What is your entry? What's your exit? What's your risk reward? What position size? What's your goal? What's your thesis? What's the chart say? People just want things to be simple. They don't want to put in the time. Then they wonder why they don't get the reward. So all of my millionaire students are nerds. They're such dedicated nerds. Some of them, I have to like be like, yo, watch out for your health. Jack Kellogg, one of my students, he was a valet. He was watching my videos while parking people's cars. He studied all my videos. So dedicated. Started with a few thousand dollars in valet tips. Now he's over 12.7 million. He's up nearly a million in the first three months of 2024. Wow. I have to tell him to pull back. I'm like, yo, protect yourself. Hmm. He's trading through. He had like strep and mono. He's like, I'm not going to the doctors. I'm trading. I'm like, dude, I don't want you to die. So yeah. you have to choose. Like I have to get my millionaire students to come back to reality every now and then, hmm. even when they hit a big milestone, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's just another milestone. I'm trading. I'm, I'm learning. And they're focused on their spreadsheets. So it's a whole, um, different, you know, different grouping of perspective. There's a lot of lazy people who want hot picks. They don't do well. Mm -hmm. There's some very few dedicated students. Out of my thousands of students, I probably have, I don't know, I give webinars. Like I just gave a webinar right before here. Mm -hmm. I have like two to 300 students. Thousands of people have access to the webinars, but only two or 300 students actually tune in. They ask live questions. Most people just don't want to put in the time. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do videos like this. This is why I show off my lifestyle. This is me constantly trying to get people to like, I say, study hard. Study hard. Study hard. I have a 30 minute video where I just say study hard. Yeah, really? Do you, do you think the people in the middle, so there's these people who just don't really put any effort in whatsoever. Yeah. You have those who are putting all the effort in. There's the people in the middle I find that are an interesting one, you know, where they are watching or they're trying to watch. They're doing something. They're taking some form of action, but maybe it's not enough. Yeah. You know, is, is there anything that you've seen with that? And, you know, what do you think it takes for them to, or any key differences they can make changes to, to be in that smaller percentage of winners. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, there, there is the, the group of lazy people, the middle people, and then the dedicated. I'm not worried about the dedicated. They're gonna be successful with my strategy or something else. One of my students, Harry Ye, actually moved to Dubai. He left penny stocks, he went into crypto. He said this a while ago, we created a crypto guide in like 2016, he was early. 
maybe even 2013. That was a while ago. Didn't really sell that many crypto guys. No one was interested in it. Now he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He chose right to go wow. into crypto. Um, but the people in the middle, I would say just dedicate yourself a little more. Like imagine what you can do if you say, okay, let me, let me just dedicate 15 minutes a day to studying. Like not just my video lessons, but like anywhere on YouTube, watching the market, like being prepared. If you can dedicate yourself like near the market open and you see how stocks spike or panic near the open. I usually trade the open. That's when there's the most volatility with penny stocks. Hmm. Maybe you don't have 15 minutes every day. Maybe there's people with jobs, with families, they have commitments. Maybe you allocate an hour per weekend and you say, okay, let me just study. Let me try to figure out what I can do with my portfolio. Not everyone should be trading, right? But different assets work for different people, different allocations. You just have to think what works for you. And you have to really think about what are the pros, what are the cons? And it takes time. So, you know, get a whiteboard, like get a list. Here's the pros, here's the cons. Here's how much time I have. Here's how much money I have. The more intricate you can be, the better you'll not necessarily succeed, but the better you'll feel because you've gone over everything and you know it inside and out. The most money that you make will be in the smallest details. But most people don't want to get to those small de details because it takes a while to really get down to the nitty gritty. Would you say then it's a matter of sacrifice, you know, as well, like just giving up some comfort, giving up some time that you could have to do something else to yeah. dedicate towards your progress? Yeah, you're sacrificing short term fun and enjoyment for long term and lasting success. If you start putting in the pieces now, most of my students are young. And like, they're like, even if they don't make a lot in year one, year two, year three, I was like, you're 24, 25, 26, what does it matter, right? Even if you made a million dollars, you'd probably just blow it on stupid stuff right now because you don't have the right perspective. Mm. Then you have older people where they really need money, they love money, they respect how much it can change their life, but they don't necessarily have time because they have kids, they have businesses, they have families, they have a lot of responsibilities and they wish that they could go back in time. So I need to try to reach people when they're young because when people start studying when they're young, it's amazing to see what happens over time with trading, with investing. Like we're all very fortunate enough to be in this century with the single best returns in the market. Like there's, so much. There's a good book called Triumph of the Optimist, very small um, book that very few people know. But this century has been the most successful century in the history of mankind in terms of different markets. And we're just starting again because of this information revolution like Robin Hood and, you know, just everything that's going on, just the whole growth of information. So you have to really think about what can you do this year, 2024, 2025, to make your 2026, 2027, 2030 great. I closed one of my webinars the other day. I was like, how good is your 2035 going to be? And they're like, how jet lagged are you, Tim? <laughs> and I was like, no, you're planning for 2035. So if you can plan now for 10 years out, you're ahead of so many people. Mm -hmm. Most people don't think 10 years out or five years or even one year out. Mm -hmm. You just have to think about your future and how your money can grow faster than inflation, right? We have inflation. Your money is decreasing. Your money value is decreasing and your time is decreasing. So how do you counter that? And you can bust through all that. So many people are like, oh, my dollar's not worth as much inflation. Shut up. It's a few percent a year. You can't figure out how to make a few percent a year. You're not trying hard enough. Mm. Anybody can make a few percent a year. You might not make a billion. You might not make a million. But you can easily outperform the 8 to 10% per year that most people think is like, well, that's average. Mm. That's crap. If you're making 8 to 10% per year, especially in 2000 or $5,000, what are you doing? Like, oh, I'll just invest in the S&P 500. I have $5,000. Okay, enjoy your $500 a year. It's not worth it. If you have a small amount, you have to figure out how can you use different strategies. Like crypto, I missed the boat on, right? Mm -hmm. I should have gone into crypto. I, penny stocks. I chose the wrong sketchy industry. <laughs> if, I was, if I was a crypto trader from the beginning, I mean, I'd be a billionaire. So I chose the wrong industry. But there's still millions to be made in penny stocks. And crypto, frankly, is just scary. <laughs> Do you think it's uh, like the Wild West to you? Correct. Do you feel like penny stocks was the Wild West at one point, but because of obviously how long you've been in there, it's just uh, something you've gotten accustomed to and yeah. understand? And penny stocks are regulated, you know? Mm -hmm. Like the problem with crypto is like you get you get scammed. Who are you going to call? Like mm -hmm. what? You, you did this to yourself. You're in this industry where there's no laws 
what government agency is beholden to you. I get DMs all the time from people who have been scammed for any number of reasons in crypto. And I have so many imposters online. FYI, there's no Timothy Sykes 7432 messaging you. I don't DM anybody. I'm not WhatsApping anybody. There's just imposters. And they say, oh, invest in this little crypto project. And they desperate people believe, oh, you, I can guarantee you doubling your money. Mm -hmm. And it sucks. So I have to stay away from crypto just because of the risks. But there is upside. I, I'm not immune to looking at it. I mean, it's been the single Bitcoin has been the single best performing asset of the past decade. It's, been, it's even now it's, it's at an all time high right now, which is crazy. Um, going back to the penny stock side of things. So like with penny stocks, it's like new companies. It's companies that are on the rise, have potential. And as you alluded to earlier, like you do research, you'll find that, you know, a PO box, for example, or one's a barn, for example, like what is the process of sort of doing your trades? Are you having to do that for all your trades, like this level of research or because it's more of a trade, you're basing it off technical analysis? Yeah, so I'm trading only the most active penny stocks these days, like Signacy transactions that print and home ticketing company. I've never invested in a company or believed in a technology like that. Mm -hmm. Even though I was right about print at home ticketing, every time I print tickets at home for, for something, I'm like, I was there in the <laughs> beginning. I still am bitter. Um, I can do the fundamental research, but because I just expect every company to be a scam, it's really not as important. Mm -hmm. For me, when I dig through their SEC filings, which you should do, even if you're investing in a company, dig through the SEC filings. Um, you can research so much. You can see, even if it's a scam, you can see specific dates where like, restricted shares become unrestricted and insiders will just dump it. A lot of the times uh, these companies do promotions for one week, two weeks, one month, and the promotions, they get, you know, whoever the promoters are, they get paid 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 shares of stock. It's always disclosed at the bottom of the promotions. But then if you look at the SEC filings, these promotions are timed when restricted shares become unrestricted. So the insiders are pumping up the stock and then they're dumping shares, pump and dump. Um, so you can see specific dates. So you know, like if there's a promotion for two weeks and you're like, wait a minute, digging on the SEC filings, page 14, all the directors can sell in 30 days. It's pretty amazing. Sometimes we've seen stocks where they spike 200, 300% over a week or two during a promotion, and then they drop 80, 90% in two or three days. So you can spot that in the filings, but people don't want to read filings, right? You have press releases, which are one pagers, and it's nice and glossy. Look how great the company is, the technology is. The SEC filings are 50, 60, 70 pages. So I have a DVD called Learn to Read SEC Filings, how to spot red flags in these filings. Like on page 56 of some filing, you might be able to see something. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to do if you want to dig. For me, I'm trading the most active penny stocks. Um, the promoters have decreased a lot lately in uh, you know, 2023, 2024. Promoters have pretty much gone down. I don't know if you know Atlas Trading. They were, they were like stock promoters, and they j actually just got off the other day. So I'm, I'm hoping promotion comes back. Mm. I actually like the promoters because they pump up stocks, and they're such idiots. It's so obvious. Yeah. Lately, I've just been trading a lot of short squeezes. Um, some of these penny stocks have gone from like 2 to 50, 2 to 100. HOLO went from 2 to 100 in two weeks. Complete joke of a company. Now it's back down to like 3 or 4. This is a volatility. You were talking about like you know volume and unlimited liquidity on other sides. But it and they're seems trading, like penny stocks is, is they're trading has millions moments. of shares a day. So mm. if you focus on the most liquid, most volatile plays, you don't necessarily need to do that much fundamental research. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trading the the upside, and you know I used to short sell. I don't even short sell anymore. Really? Yeah, not worth it. Yeah, the risks and the squeezes are too great. You know, back when I used to short, companies would go from like 2 to 15 or like 3 to 20 and then back down. Now they're going literally Beyond higher and that. higher. There's too many short sellers. It's also partially my fault because I've promoted. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've promoted short selling so much and people see, wait a minute, these are scams. They will drop. Nine out of 10 penny stocks will drop. So yeah. short selling works. But it's that one that gets you and then people blow up. Yeah. So for me as a conservative teacher, I can't short sell. Even if it might be profitable for me, I know that it would open the door to like blowing up my students. Yeah. Right. It's like giving a student a live grenade and being like, don't don't take the pin out. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, what is it? What would it do if I take the pin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense completely. Uh, what were your thoughts in terms of the Wall Street bets? You remember what how was seeing that? Because that was insane. Everyone, even people who weren't into trading, heard about that, tried to get involved in that, etc. So this is kind of a, a consequence of this um, growth in, in information and the power of crowds, right? Mm. Like, you know, Reddit actually just IPO'd the other day. Yes. Um, 
there's a lot of power in these groups. And Wall Street Bets and Atlas Trading, again, they, they use size and numbers and they're pumping up stocks. So they're squeezing shorts. I mean, that was crazy, like where they're squeezing the hedge funds. Um, but at the same time, it ended, right? Like then the hedge funds countered. Like even if the, the hedge funds lose for a little bit, they just have so much money and so much more expertise, they're going to come back. It was nice, like, oh, retail traders can win. Okay, for a little bit, you know? Every now and then, depending on what your favorite sport is, like, the, the champion of your sport can get dethroned by, like, you know, a nobody. Yeah. And it can happen a little bit because they, they might get too cocky, they get caught off guard. That's what Wall Street Bets was. Um, and again, that's a good lesson for hedge funders. It's a good lesson for anybody. doesn't matter how successful you are, how much money you have, you can always get dethroned if you get too cocky. Cocky. Hmm. And the hedge funds were too cocky. Melvin Capital was too cocky. You know, Reddit took advantage of it and they found the weakness. So it's really kind of cool where in this market that wasn't possible, you know, years ago or decades ago. But in this market, the smallest person on Reddit or any message board, if you have a good thesis, it can play out hmm. and you can win. But again, that's like a long shot. So everyone celebrates it, you know, and some people are still holding like GameStop stock as it like yeah. crashes, like ape strung together. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, your thesis is busted. It's not, it's not a short squeeze anymore. There's other plays that are short squeezes. Mm -hmm. So that's been my primary strategy the past like two years, just buying short squeezes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm buying the worst of the worst. So there's a lot of companies that dilute, mm -hmm. whether it's insider selling or they're doing a financing, you know that it's gonna drop. So a lot of short sellers are like, this company has no cash, they're being pumped up, it's gonna crash. And I say, okay, yes, the company has no cash, it's being pumped up, but there's too many shorts, so it can squeeze further. Yeah. So the worst of the worst companies can spike the most. And that freaks people out. People are like, why is the stock spiking? They're a terrible company. Mm -hmm. Because there's too many shorts and they're getting squeezed. You mentioned earlier in terms of the size of your wins, right? You were, were you saying $1,500? $1,500 is my average win over 20 plus years. Wait, even even now? So I trade with a small account. I go back to 12000 I started with $12,000. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. 12000 into $7.6 million. Um, I go back to 12000 starting every year with very small positions. So this year I'm up like nearly $80,000 wow. So in three months. So people would say like, oh, $80,000, you have been trading for, you know, two decades mm. this is it but again I'm, I'm trading you can see all my trades i show every trade win and loss um and in the beginning of the year i'm winning like 200 300 400 i gotta show how to grow a small account mm -hmm. and people don't understand it's good to take small singles i say take singles because then your account gets bigger and you can bet bigger so by the end of the year my average win will probably be like five or ten thousand but right now it's smaller because I start small and I donate all the trading profits. Yeah. So it's about teaching the process because most of my students have two, three, five thousand yeah. dollars. So it doesn't make a difference. A lot of people with chat rooms and services, like they literally like use their subscribers. They're like, oh, let me buy like, you know, a million shares and then tell everybody. And then you pump up the stock and they make, oh, I made half a million dollars on the day. And then they post a screenshot on Twitter and everyone's like, I want to make half a million. Yeah. And they don't realize it's a whole scheme. Mm -hmm. So I tell people never follow alerts from anybody. The only reason why I trade with small amounts is to show here's why I'm buying. Here's why I'm cutting losses. Here's why I'm selling. Mm -hmm. What's the chart? What's my thesis? So every trade is a good lesson. Yeah. I've got 9,000 video lessons. I can imagine. I can imagine. Literally 9,132. So wow. I, I keep track. I have a whole like Netflix of video lessons, good trades, bad trades, morning panic dip buys, mm. breaking news spikers, afternoon fades. And you can see these patterns repeat. That's why I like penny stocks because it's my small pond. Yeah. There's only a few key patterns and it repeats over and over. Like, okay, this promoter's spiking the stock. Okay, this chat room is caught short. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts though in terms of why not? At this stage, you trade with a larger size. I know what you just mentioned there in terms of uh, chat rooms and stuff like that, but let's say just for you, even if you are donating to charity, for example, like why wouldn't you want to, because of your experience and because you know you have your edge and your profitability and is, is there, of course, why wouldn't you just trade with larger size and therefore have the larger profits? Because it's not about me. It's mm -hmm. about the students. Mm -hmm. So I treat my account as if I'm one of my students. What should students do? I don't want students betting too big. I don't want students betting aggressively. I'm literally trading from my laptop. I got two laptops in my backpack and I'm traveling the world. When I'm traveling the world, Wi-Fi is going up and down. I don't want to trade with big size. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I have enough stress in my life. Um, but also I'm trying to trade like I think students should. So if my students ever question a trade, I'm going to do the cowardly approach because I think they should be cowards. Right. Especially in the beginning, I say you can always get it more aggressive, take more size on your own time. I'm going to teach you to be cowards. 
I have a whole DVD where I talk in a high pitched voice. I'm like, hi, I'm a castrated choir boy. This is how I trade. I have no balls. <laughs> and I literally talk like this. Because if you are a coward, it's very difficult to lose big. I say cut losses quickly. I have a 30 minute video on YouTube where I just say cut losses quickly. Mm. It's my, one of my most popular videos. So I cut losses. I trade cowardly. I take singles. My average loss, 1, 2%. My average win, 5 to 10%. So if you win 60, 70% of the time and you're winning 5 to 10% on your wins and you lose roughly 30% of the time and you're losing 1 to 2%, your account grows. You just need to stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. So I, I've really created this lane for myself and kind of shown this path to students. Yeah. And this is how I create millionaires. So like my business is teaching people and creating millionaires. So it's not about my trades. I can make a million dollars on a trade. What would that do for students? Nothing. It would teach them to bet big. It would teach them bad rules. It would, you know, be, you know, counter effective. So would you say your R multiples around two to three? Yes. Yeah. I know some people like their R's, right? Like, so two to three, sometimes three to four, but like it's, I play a very simple cowardly game. Some people are surprised. They're like, like you said, like you've been trading so long, like you can easily take on more risk. I can, but can my students? Mm -hmm. It's not like, like, I don't short sell anymore, not because it wouldn't be profitable for me. I know which scams are gonna crash, but if students do it, if you know that like students don't know much and you have a strategy that yes, could make them money, but it could also blow them up. In short selling, you can lose more than you put in. So forget about just losing all your money. Let's say you have a $5,000 account, uh, an irresponsible student, and they're like, this is a scam. It's going to go down. They're looking at dilution tracker, and they're looking at all these tools being like, this is a bad company. It should be valued at 90% lower. And they're shorting, and they're shorting, and they're shorting. They're like, this market doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. There's a saying, like, the market can remain more nonsensical than you can remain liquid and, you yeah. know, alive. So if you know there's like, let's say, basically not even a grenade, it's a nuclear option. Mm -hmm. If you give like a kid a button and it says, don't push that button, this is a nuclear button. If you do this, your world will end. The kid just doesn't know. Mm -hmm. It's like giving a baby a, a nuclear button. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to give them that option. If you don't short sell, you can't lose more than you put in. Yeah. In terms of that then, so like you obviously pushed all your students for so long. You've had huge success with 40 millionaires and I'm sure like loads of other successful in the six figures as well. Yes. Like, would you say that you've made more money from education than from trading? Many times over, 100%. My business is teaching, okay? So there's like this hate online where it's like, you're not a trader, you're a teacher. You don't even trade anymore. I'm like, well, here's 20 plus years of my trades. I trade small because it works for me and I think this is how to teach students. So I really like, you know, I'm trading with like two arms behind my back, like trading small, trading cowardly. I don't need to, but I think that's a good way for students to be. And focusing on students first has led to a growth in business. Um, you know, it makes me very happy at night knowing how many scams there are, how many people lose. And I'm like putting my little bit of good out into the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I have haters and I'm like, and they're like, you're a scam. You're like, you suck. And I'm like, okay, which one of my rules do you disagree with? And I have like blog posts with like 90 rules. And I was like, do you disagree with cutting losses? Do you agree with like trading cowardly? Do you agree that most penny stocks are scams? Like, tell me specifically what makes me a scam? And there's no response because they don't even look at my rules. They just don't like the idea of someone who can trade profitably and is teaching. Most people who are teachers are frauds. Mm. There's a whole, forget about just penny stock frauds. Most people in the teaching industry are frauds. They're selling snake oil. But for me, I found a strategy that is very disciplined and cowardly, but it can make you profitable and it, it keeps you in the right lane. So I'm very proud to teach that. And I think that there's a huge need for that in the, the teaching industry. That's why I got into teaching. There's so many scams and I never had a teacher. So I'm always trying to be the mentor to people that I never had. It's interesting you say that though, because most, I've not seen, personally anyway, I haven't seen another educational thing within the finance or trading sector where someone's sowing these millionaires. Because not only have you, is one thing saying it, but I've also seen where you're on a Steve Harvey's yeah. talk show and you had three of your students, three, two, two three of your students yeah. with you. he flew them over. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. That whole Steve Harvey thing came up like last second. Literally it was in, I don't know if you know this, uh, in Facebook you have two inboxes. 
You have people who you're connected with and people who you aren't connected with. Yeah, so with. it goes into like another... In another inbox. So I was at Thanksgiving dinner with my family. Everyone's asking me for stock tips. I'm like, I don't want to give stock tips. Like, get me out of here. I was like, oh, I got to go. I got to go check my email. At that time, I had actually checked all my email. Now I have 200,000 unread emails. I can't keep up. I'm <laughs> sorry to everyone. I'm trying to keep up, but I, I can't keep it under 200,000. <laughs> at the time, this was years ago, I had no unread emails, but I saw the other inbox. I was like, ah, oh, let me read the other inbox. And two weeks prior, a producer from Steve Harvey had messaged me being like, oh, we're featuring millionaires. I was like, yes, I want to be on your show. And they set up the whole interview. They flew me. They flew my parents out. They flew two of my students out. Um, Michael Good actually was one of the students on there. He was my first online hater. He wrote a blog really? post, Tim Sykes is full of bullshit. And we went back and forth in the comments. He made like a lot of assumptions about like teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, no, no. And he gave me a chance. And now he's made over $2 million, he became my chat room moderator. He helped me mentor. So if you can turn your haters wow. into millionaires, you've got something. <laughs> um, but again, I'm just proud to be real. And, and there's a, a huge uh, need for real people in the teaching industry. That's my whole secret. Like people are like, what is this? There has to be some scam. Like you're trading on the side. No, I show all my trades. Like you're trading more aggressively. No, like just be real. That's my number one tip to people. If you're real, again, even if you have losses, like you had a big loss a little while ago, just be real about it. Own up to it. No one has to be perfect, mm -hmm. but there's a whole shady world out there where people pretend to be perfect. Traders on Twitter. If you look at traders on Twitter and you looked at their profits, you would think everyone's profitable. You think 90% mm -hmm. of traders win. This is amazing, but they're screenshot heroes, right? Yeah. It's like, do you play golf at all? I've tried. Same. Yeah. I suck at it. <laughs> but with golf, there's 18 holes. You have to record your score on every hole, yeah. right? And then you add up your score after 18 holes. That's your round. The screenshot heroes on Twitter, they might play 18 holes, but they're only showing like, look, I made three birdies. Yeah. And then they're not showing the other 15 holes. And you're like, it doesn't matter what one screenshot says. You need to show all your trades as a whole. People get the wrong idea. So there's a lot of people, maybe they bet their entire account. Maybe they have multiple accounts and they're showing just their big wins and they're luring people into thinking that they win 90, 100 percent of the time. So for me, I'm very proud to win roughly 70% of the time. I'm very proud to show $100, $200 losses. I had a $27,000 loss. I got undisciplined a few months ago, made a whole video about it, my most successful video in years. People really? are like, more of that. I'm like, no, no more of that. <laughs> yeah. I was a freaking moron. Like I literally, as disciplined as I am, it's a slippery slope, right? And if you let yourself get attached to a company or an idea or you fat finger mistake, I fat finger mistake. I wanted to buy 8,000 shares of this biotech stock. Biotechs were running pre-market back then. Mm. And I was trying to buy 8,000 shares. I have an old keyboard, which I probably should get a new one. I destroy my laptops. I literally bought 80,000 shares with an extra zero. And I was like, oh no, what did I do? The stock is dropping. I buy another 80,000. So now I, all I wanted was 8,000 shares and I'm in for 160,000 shares, throwing all my discipline out the window. It's all within seconds, but the biotech is dropping and I'm like, no, I have to ride this hot biotech. It keeps dropping. I'm like, whoa, whoa, this is, this is bad. Lose 27,000. I didn't even use, like literally I have stocks to trade on my shirt. This is software I use every day. Stocks to trade has a breaking news channel. Mm -hmm. Stocks to trade had broke news that this biotech that I was buying just did a toxic financing and I'm buying it 20 times over what I wanted to. And I'm not even checking my own software for the breaking news. Literally, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Like how could I be such a moron to throw out all my rules, to not use the software that I use every day that I tell people to use and I lost 27,000. The one thing is I cut losses after a few minutes, it would have been 95,000 by the end of the day. But wow. that was my biggest loss in years. My previous biggest loss was 6,000. So 6,000 to 27,000 like that, that's how slippery a slope it is. It's interesting you bring that up because I've, when people ask me about trading and they don't know, they don't know about trading, they don't know any better. So they ask me about trading and they say, you know, but yeah, it'll be hard and you probably lose some money, but once you got it, you got it, right? And I always, I've always personally tried to tell them, yes, but the reality of losing at any time is always there. So you, you could be the best trader, but 20, you know, 25 years, for example, and you can just make one mistake and it can all be over, yeah. right? And I remember I was saying this, this, this literally happened a few weeks back, this conversation. And then the other person next to me was a trader and he tried to step in and just be like, that's not that bad. I don't, not, not to say I was wrong, but more so to be like, don't put a negative spin on it. Like, yeah, you'll be fine. Like, you use your risk management, you'll be cool. Yeah. Because I was trying to say, yes, you can use risk management, but something like that. That is a prime example where you make a human error 
and then because it was an error you feel like let me just write this error you know you try to dig yourself out yeah and you compound the error exponentially and after that i mean i went back to trading with small size i'm still like in the doghouse this was nearly a year ago Mm. because i don't trust myself i was like 25 years of discipline and i just like to be fair the biotech issued positive news and they had some positive data and then they did a toxic financing like 30 minutes later, which I had never seen. Usually like even the scummiest companies announce good news in the morning than an offering like a, a toxic financing at lower prices in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. But this was 30 minutes apart. So it was a little different, but how could I not check breaking news? And it was, I was just caught up in the moment, right? I was like all, I was like a bull just seeing red mm-hmm. and I'm like, I must get it back. There had been like five biotech runners that week that I had missed. I was like, this is my chance to make it. Mm-hmm. And all the mistakes compounded into one. And fortunately it was mm-hmm. only 27,000. But if I had been trading with a multi-million dollar account, it could have been 270,000. It could have been two. Po- I literally threw out all my rules and it still to this day blows my mind that I could do that. Cause mm-hmm. like you, you set rules, you set max loss, you set risk parameters. And in the moment, in a fast moving market, it can all go away. So you really have to be careful. A lot of my millionaire students, when they're on a hot streak, they actually wire out. Like mm-hmm. Jack Kellogg, like, you know, he's made nearly a million dollars. He just wired out. He texts me, he's like, made like nearly a million in the past few weeks. I'm wiring the profits out. Cause he doesn't trust himself. This mm-hmm. is the thing. Cause trading is about greed and it's all about your mental ability to stay disciplined. And if there's too much money, you make, you're doing too well. Or like on that one on EFTR, I had missed five other biotech runners. I was like, I'm going to make it back with this one. And I didn't even lose anything on the other ones. I just missed it. FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand these emotions, realize it can happen to anybody. I might do better than newbies, but I'm not perfect. I'm not immune to making dumbass trades. And that's how slippery of a slope trading can be. So, you know, there's a case to be made just for passive investing. If you have millions in the bank, make your eight to 10% per year. That's been proven. Or, you know, just buy Bitcoin and hold. That's <laughs> been proven lately. Um, trading though, I, I really like being in control of my money. And it's like, eat what you kill. You have to be disciplined. The market should be giving you opportunities. Right now, the market's giving us opportunities every single day. Like it's a hot market. When the markets are hitting new highs, there's so many stocks spiking 50, 100, 200% every day in penny stocks. I can't even keep up. Like I look down at my fingers. I don't have enough fingers to make all the trades I want to make. And I'm sending out alerts. I'm sending out commentary. My students are like, yo, this is crazy. How's it been like uh, maintaining your trading life, your travel and your, your teaching? <laughs> it's a process, you know, um, like, like, People are surprised, like, I'm not married. They're like, you know, mm-hmm. why aren't you married yet? I'm like, yo, I'm married to my job. Like, <laughs> literally, I'm trying to just stay sane. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I weren't so passionate about teaching, if I weren't so necessarily passionate about, like, my charity, like, we've also been filming documentaries. This month marks three years of our latest documentary in Bali. We, we built 52 schools in Bali, 13 homes, two recycling centers now, an anti-trafficking charity, and we've been documenting it. And I'm basically like the director. Um, Do I need that in my life? No, but it really gives me purpose. Mm -hmm. So you have to find what gives you purpose and then you're just trying to make it work. I really love teaching. It makes the market meaningful. I know a lot of people, they've been in the market five, 10, 15 years. It's not a good thing. They want to quit because like they're addicted to the numbers. They're addicted to the money. They know it's not healthy. For me, I've sized down. I donate my trading profits to charity. I take immense pride in teaching people rules. So I've made my market experience work for me. Hmm. You have to really get introspective. I was a philosophy major in college. That helped me a lot. All my friends were business majors. I already studied business. I'm like, why am I paying for this? Like, I do this on my own. I took night classes so I could actually trade during the day in college. I was like already addicted. But philosophy really helped me understand the smartest man is the man who knows nothing. You know, and and I'm really thinking about what makes me happy, what fulfills me. People are like, oh, you have so much energy. Yeah, I have one coffee, but I'm getting like four or five hours of sleep. I'm pumped. You can't stop me. Even if I made no money from teaching, right? But I do want to make more because now we have new tools. Like with Stocks to Trade, we have these new AI tools that are coming out. And it's only because the business is growing that we can actually afford it. AI is expensive. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've tried your hand at it. It's just starting. I've not tried. I've tried like using it for like research and stuff. But that's about it. But that's what it is, mm-hmm. right? It's AI is crunching data that our human brains exactly. can't see. It's, mm-hmm. it's finding patterns and it's just starting, right? This is inning one for AI, but mm-hmm. AI researchers, AI programmers are expensive. They're highly in demand. 
So I'm proud that my business is growing, that we can actually hire this and, and try these new AI tools. And it's just a time saver, right? Mm -hmm. For me, I can't crunch all this data. Like I said, I, I don't have enough fingers to make all the trades, let alone the research, the research reports. So I think it's just a tool to help us. It's like the droids in like Star Wars, like yeah. R2-D2, you know, 3PO, mm -hmm. C-3PO. You like Star Wars? Yeah, yeah, don't, don't get me started. Though. Oh, don't yeah, nice. Oh, my, my wife hates it. She hates it. Why? I don't know. She hasn't watched it. Yeah, she, she needs to watch it. She should watch it. I know. It's good. There's like some some good and bad, but like there's a whole universe. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I think AI is just becoming where some people are scared of it. It doesn't matter if you're scared. It's happening whether you like it or not. So when, when like these things happen, like AI or like uh, even what was it? The oh, VR, for example, yeah. like these new technologies, right? Would you say that even you know through your 25 years in penny stocks, do they end up going through the penny stocks realm first a lot of the time? And it's like before it's even gone to sort of mainstream, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, people buy hype in penny stocks. People buy trends. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I first started, Y2K was a thing. Do you remember Y2K? Yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah. When year 2008, everyone thought the computers were going to die. There were all these Y2K plays that went from like three to 100, five to 200. And it turned out to be nothing. It turned yeah. out to be a complete fake. Um, you had nano nanotech, which was supposed to be amazing. You had 3D printers. Uh, you had weed stocks. You had China stocks. You had shipping stocks. There's so many different groups that have been hyped up. And penny stocks take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when the pandemic happened, a lot of the same stocks that had spiked during Ebola fears, mm -hmm. like mass companies, biohazard suits. There was a ticker LAKE. Mm -hmm. They make the big white biohazard suits. Mm -hmm. When Ebola popped off, and Ebola didn't break out huge, fortunately, but the Ebola stock surged. Then when the pandemic hit, I made a lot of money just remembering from the Ebola stocks and the same thing. Right now, AI is hot. Any company, especially penny stocks, they say, we're getting into AI, and it can triple or quadruple in a few days. Very similar to when I first started, dot-coms were a big thing back in 2000, yeah. okay? One of my first strategies, you're going to laugh at how simple it was, companies would add dot-com to their name. So, like, there was a company, Sportsman's Guy, they sell camping equipment. Mm -hmm. And I remember they sell camping equipment, they put out a press release, we're going to be Sportsman's Guy dot-com, we're going to sell online. And I bought the stock because like dot com companies were spiking and the stock spiked from like three to 14 over four days just because they added dot com. So anytime there's a press release, we're adding dot com. I would buy the stock on day one and it would double or triple by day two, day three. And I was like, I'm like looking around. I'm like, am I being pranked? Like, <laughs> like what, what is going on here? But now companies are adding dot AI to their name or getting into AI. Yeah. Same exact pattern 20 plus years later. The dot com, some of them made it, you know, Amazon like became huge, but like mm -hmm. diapers.com went nowhere. Like a lot of the biggest companies end up failing. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA wouldn't surprise me if they get overtaken. Right now, everyone thinks NVIDIA can do no wrong, but they're early. They could just be like an early Netscape type winner. It's tough because AI requires so much, um, you know, equipment and, and time and money to mm -hmm. invest, but that's not to say NVIDIA will be on top forever. So, I would always be cautious about trends, but I say ride the hype while you can. Mm. It doesn't matter if Y2K faded. There was still a lot of money to be made. It doesn't matter if dot coms faded, just like AI. So I'm just open to any hot trend. And, you know, frankly, we needed a hot trend. I'll take it. Would you say that that is the job of a trader, regardless of whether it's penny stocks or options or futures or even Forex? Yeah. You have to be in tune with the market. So not just the, the charts but also in tune with what's impacting the charts, like the trends, for example. So then you can begin to apply your edge. So you could have an edge that's technical based, but if you're not in tune with what's happening and what's what the things that are happening that are gonna impact those charts, you're not gonna be able to apply that edge anyway, effectively. So I say you have two moving targets, what mm -hmm. works for you and what's working in the market. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, did you see, um, what was that? Uh, Top Gun 2 with Tom Cruise? The, the 2 or the latest well, one? Well, the, the 2 is the latest one. Okay, okay. Yeah, I did. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. But yeah. it's like a fighter jet where like if you're in the air and you have your enemy in your crosshairs and the enemy is going back and forth and you're going back and forth and the goal is to line yourself up with the enemy and fire. Yeah. And you got to get them in the cross. That's you in the market, right? So you're moving constantly. Like, should I go long? Should I go short? Should I take a big size? Should I have small size? And the market's moving. And you're literally trying trying to get in tune with the market. That's that's the best analogy that I can make. So I'm not the biggest fan of AI plays. They're kind of choppy, um, but I'm trying to trade them because I recognize the trend. 
Um, I wasn't the biggest fan of short squeezes. I prefer promotions. I prefer, you know, other patterns, but short squeezes are in. And over the past year, I've gotten much better. Um, the cool thing is with like my 9,000 video lesson library, you can see me sucking at short selling and like trying to ride the short squeezes. Cause I was like, I know this company sucks, but there's so many shorts. I'm trying to ride it. And I get too freaked out. I'm like, no, the fundamentals are so bad. So I wasn't really in tune with the market in the past six months and especially three months, I've gotten much more in tune with riding the short squeezes. Um, so like we were talking about in the beginning, like you have to find what you're good at. You might not be good at something in the beginning. You have to work at it. It's not like you're just born a trader. Like people are like, do you think you're born a trader? Is there an innate school? Like, no, you have to really get yourself on the right path, but some things start to click. Like Jack is very good, Jack Kellogg, my student, very good at taking big size. He's very comfortable with it. He was riding Fannie Mae for several weeks just the other day. And I was like, take profits, take profits, take profits. He was up like nearly 400 grand. He didn't end up wow. taking profits. He's literally riding it. He's got his trend lines. He's like, nope, I'm not selling. And then it violated his downside and he locked in 150,000 on Friday. He was up for 400,000. That's his, he's used to that. Mm -hmm. he's, that. he's okay with that. And I'm like, yo, that's crazy. Um, but he found what works for him and he's still learning. He's got Excel spreadsheets galore. He's all data-based. I have zero Excel spreadsheets. That's my own failing. I should be. I have Excel spreadsheets of charities and, and restaurants. Those are my two passions, <laughs> right? Sadly, it's true. I mm -hmm. wish I was kidding, but I have to be real about it. I love restaurants. I love charities. Mm -hmm. If I was better at math and, and spreadsheets, I would be a better trader, but do you feel like if there was a software available? Because we have uh, TradeZella, for okay. example. Yeah, yeah. TradeZella. I'm, Trade I'm not sure if uh, Penny Stocks is available on there yet. Maybe it is. I'll have to find out for you. Yeah. But let's say if there was a software that was automated for you, is that something you would then use? So it gives you all that data without you having to input it yourself? Um, I mean, so for me, the Excel spreadsheets that Jack and a lot of my top students do, it's their own trades and they're tracking it based on, you know, different patterns and, and tagging stuff like that. And they're just getting data based on that way. For me, you have to understand, going back to the example where I'm like this childhood vampire, I'm not trying to get better as a trader at mm -hmm. this point. It's too late for me. I'm literally not changing because I'm teaching a very specific pattern that's worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm frankly overwhelmed. So some people are like, oh, okay, you do penny stocks, you can do this. Oh, these, these students do Excel spreadsheets. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm not changing. It's too late for me. But I encourage my students to try. Like Jack has, you know, spreadsheets and, you know, he's actually helping me mentor students now too. Um, I think that you should be open to it until you get to a point where your life is so full. So mm -hmm. for me... Unfortunately, I, my life is too full. Mm -hmm. But the good news is I've refined my patterns enough where I frankly I don't need it. And I have like this photographic memory where I can remember charts. I have this great history of trading. So I might not have the exact Excel spreadsheets and data that a lot of my top students have, but I have a really good memory mm -hmm. and now a huge library. So you know like your R multiple, your your sort of loss to win ratio, yeah. etc. I know my comfort zone. This is a crazy thing. Mm -hmm. Like is it hot in here? Why are you not sweating? Like it's it's hot in here. I'm I'm, I'm constantly I'm sweating. used to it now. <laughs> yeah, you're used to it. But it the crazy in the thing beginning. is, I only sweat when I'm here in Dubai when it's hot out. Mm -hmm. Also, when I'm in a bad trade, I have like a biological response. Mm -hmm. Literally, where if I'm in a bad trade, I start sweating. Yeah, and my body knows it. That's not Excel spreadsheets. That's experience. And so sometimes I notice myself sweating. And I'm like, oh, I need to get out. How crazy is that? Mm -hmm. But it happens. And if I'm in a good trade, I'm not sweating. Like I'm, I'm good and I feel comfortable. So like I can, I can literally picture because I've done thousands of trades now and I show everything and I can picture like the perfect trade and I know what's going right. Like it's for me, sometimes I don't even take losses. Like this is the thing. Jax, he's drawing his trend lines. He's not going to take profits until like his trends break up or down, right? Mm -hmm. For me, I oftentimes take profits of like 1% when the play is not bouncing properly or whatever. And I don't have a loss. It hasn't violated any terms. I just don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's very old school. You know, it's not data based um, and it's not good for people like trading with size. But I'm trading again like a student. So mm -hmm. I have a very interesting thing. And it's, it's not good or bad. Like I, I wish I could go back in time and do Excel spreadsheets and, you know, start off on the right path. Can't. I'm too, I'm too late. Old, old people get more stubborn. <laughs> in terms of. Earlier, you mentioned the Wolf of Wall Street, right? Jordan Belfort. And if I'm not mistaken, you did like an interview with him. Yeah, yeah. When was that? 
Uh, what was it now? A year and a half, two years ago. Um, oh, so no longer. Yeah, yeah. It was it was interesting because like he created the penny stock market and he basically created the seminar market. So like two markets that I'm in, mm-hmm. and he's like the godfather. Um, but it was a very technical talk because um, he was you know he came into the interview thinking like I'm a scammer. Right. Like, you. yeah, because mm-hmm. like penny stocks are a scam. He created the penny stock scam industry. I'm now like Mr. Penny Stock. So they thought that I was a scam. And I was explaining how like I'm I'm understanding that promoters promote stocks. I'm riding the promotions or back then I was like short selling promotions. Now I'm riding short squeeze. And he mm-hmm. was like he was actually like curious. It was actually funny to see in the interview. And he's like, wait, so so you see the promoters are promoting and you're buying on the backs of promoters. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, oh, huh, huh. and like he didn't think of that because, again, as a promoter, there's so much money for him as a promoter, mm-hmm. right? For me, I'm just riding the back. I'm like a little bird on the back of like a big rhino, right? Mm-hmm. So there's little profits riding the, the promotion, but you can't take too much size because the promotion can end. Yeah. I'm riding short squeezes. You can't take too much size because the short squeeze can end. Mm-hmm. So he didn't think in terms of small size. And I could see that. Like if you watch the interview, he's actually curious. And he's like, oh, so you're just making like a thousand or two. And he's like, not a bad strategy. And he was like, <laughs> I, got, I got like the okay from it. It was a very strange interview. Yeah. He's a nice guy, but it was like, he didn't, he didn't know what I was doing. And then, you know, he, he, I explained it to him. It was, it was very yeah. strange. Cause it's so interesting because I, I didn't even watching the movie is really weird. So like watching the movie, I feel like I know me watching it. I love the movie. I was like, wow, this is an incredible movie. What a crazy story, what yeah. a crazy lifestyle, yeah. but you don't, get a sense really of well me anyway personally i don't know about yourself but i didn't really get a sense of like oh look how how bad was this you know in terms of what he did to anyone you know it was more like wow this is a great journey you know i would love to have been on this you know this this floor if you will and, and been part of this whole journey right uh maybe we're not for most of uh, some of it but just for the the craziness of the office and uh it's kind of weird because then you see afterwards in in reality like oh actually this was a really bad thing to do and etc so do you, is there any light in terms of what actually happened there like what was the issue so we as a society tend to glamorize lifestyle mm-hmm. right he's making millions yeah some people got screwed but people always get screwed on wall street you know they they deserved it whatever um there was another movie called boiler room i don't know if you saw that which bombed mm-hmm. and it's the other side and it's giovanni ribisi and he's one of the people who believes um, in the whole firm and you know he becomes a broker and then he actually meets some of the people that he's scamming and the people that are getting scammed uh, okay. their whole life is falling apart like some of Jordan Belfort's you know customers committed suicide they're getting wow. divorced they're losing all their money they're losing their kids um, money so it was a very non-glamorous look at the crime in the movie bombed mm-hmm. and then Wolf of Wall Street shows the glamorous side of the criminality was it about the same story? Same thing. Wow. Right? So Boiler Room is based on Stratton Oakmont and Jordan Belfort, but shown in a different light. And mm-hmm. it's very dark. It's like even the coloring of the movie, right? Scorsese like glamorized it. Like he's got like a pet chimp. He's got like a hot wife. Mm. It's glamour. Yeah, yeah, scamming. Yeah, yeah, whatever. That's Wall Street. So it's crazy to look at. Um, and it's sad because, you know, technically he still does owe a hundred million dollars plus to his, uh, victims. He created like an Australian company. So now the money that he makes from seminars and teaching aren't beholden to us. It's all like kind of muddied water, Mm. which is sad. Um, but again, like, you know, he's a scammer. He admits that he's a scammer. At least he like talks about it. Um, there are a lot of scammers out there. They don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So at least he's transparent about it. And he's like, yeah, you know, I scam people, but he also went to jail. Um, so we kind of like served his his time, but he still owes his victims. I think that's kind of messed up. I wish that he would, you know, I would really respect him if he, if he made like a hundred million with his teaching and seminars, like sell me this pen kind of mm-hmm. crap. And he gave the hundred million away. And then I would be like, yo, that's good. But he actually did like an Australian 60 minutes. He like walked out on the interview when they so, asked yeah. him about it. Mm-hmm. He like took this off, right? You know, we didn't talk about it in the podcast. So it's, it's mixed, but he's very charismatic. So mm-hmm. society loves charismatic people, even if they're criminals. And it's sad. I want people to dig deeper. We shouldn't glorify scams. Um, we sh- I don't think you need to be a scammer to make money. Like there's so much money in just being honest. I wish everyone watching this is just honest and openly admits their mistakes and their losses. Mm-hmm. The world would be better. You would learn more. Like the $27,000 mistake is one of my best YouTube videos. Type in Timothy Sykes, $27,000 loss. And I did like a 45 minute interview going through everything. It still blows my mind that I made that mistake, but I'm going to admit it and I'm going to help people learn from it. 
And a lot of people message me like that video really helps. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I think it's, so, it's a valid point as well. That we spoke about it near the beginning as well, like the glamour, glamorizing of lifestyle, glamorizing of things. I'm and guilty of glamorizing lifestyle, yeah. but it's with a purpose, mm -hmm. right? I'm not just glamorizing lifestyle because I want attention. In fact, like I don't want attention mm -hmm. anymore. Like I don't even post in real time usually. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I have like some stalkers, nothing bad, but like, you know, I like a little privacy every mm -hmm. now and then. I got a little too big, Yeah. which is fine, but I think lifestyle with purpose really helps. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just show yourself studying all the time and you're hunkered down and you're miserable and you're inside and it's like literally it looks like you're in quarantine in the pandemic. Like it, it's not a good lifestyle. It's not like, hey, I want to do that. I want to feel like crap. But that's the reality. If you want the good lifestyle, if you want to take care of your family, I'm so proud that I moved my family down to Miami Beach, got them a nice place right on Miami Beach. My parents don't have to work anymore, although they help me with my business like it's a family business. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the most proud things that I've ever done, you know? So if you want to take care of your family, if you want to live a good lifestyle, you got to sacrifice the short-term fun. You got to hunker down. And the good news is every single person watching this, you have internet access, you have YouTube access, click around, click on the related videos. Which side are the related videos? Are they over here or over here? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Either I'm, side. <laughs> I'm trying to point. Look at the related videos. Seriously, mm -hmm. click around and just learn all that you can. Mm -hmm. That's my, my tip. Interesting point you make there though as well in terms of like you have to make that sacrifice. But even when you're successful, like now, like you have, yes, the benefits of being able to travel wherever it may be, but you're still sacrificing now to make that happen. Like you won't be able to stop working, you know, stop teaching, stop trading, stop doing all these things and then still enjoy those benefits. Well, of course, yeah, when you've invested enough and you've gotten to a certain point and maybe you have passive investments, you can retire, for example. But in reality, if you want to always have that level of success that most people strive for, I think there is a fantasy and I think I had that fantasy at one point of there'll come a point where you can just switch off, but then you're living the lifestyle that you wanted. Well, the lifestyle you wanted is a double edged sword because I once upon a time was quote retired when I ma made my first few million, I was living in Madrid in my early twenties and I was like, Oh, I can just trade every now and then I got enough money and I was bored. I was so bored. A life without purpose is another sad thing where like, you picture, oh, I want to be on the Maldives and the beach and I want like this beautiful life. It's boring. For me, I wake up every day with purpose. I love my charity. I love teaching. I love traveling. I love like meeting new people. Like this is the first time we're meeting. Yeah. I love it. I wouldn't trade that. I still enjoy beaches. I still like take some time. I, I've recently tried to uh, stay in every place that I go to one extra day just for me time, which mm -hmm. is something new. And I really like that. Like when I'm going to a museum or I'm going to a new restaurant or I'm just walking around. You don't always want to be too much in a rush, but at the same time, like purpose is so fulfilling. And again, even if I made no money teaching, like I wouldn't stop And donating. I see how far the money can go. Like we've donated nearly 10 million, 7 million of it is my money. I donate my trading profits. We have charity merch, but we also have like a social media that I manage just because I have no extra time. Mm -hmm. And so I want to do that. I really think people need to find their purpose. If you are living your purpose, I mean, I don't know if you've heard the saying, like, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. It's not work for me. Like, sometimes I make a video lesson, like, I need to share this. I need to share this lesson about this student. It's inspiring. I need to share this lesson about my loss. It's helpful. I really think we should be sharing more. Mm -hmm. um, and that will make society better. That will make us better. Like, there's so much potential with social media. And I think that we're just scratching the surface. We have this whole Kardashian fake filter BS kind of thing where it's like, you know, guess what the average number of selfies a girl takes before a girl in this one study that I'm quoting uh, posts on, on Instagram. How many selfies like this? Like, you know, mm, where they're like, let's go 30 close 38, 38 selfies different angles and they're going through their phone and they're like, Oh, I like this. And this is the Kardashian effect mm -hmm. because the Kardashians have become billionaires. They're like dating and married to all the richest people and girls want this and they're getting injections in all kinds of different places. That's sad, mm -hmm. but that's just internet version 1.0. I think in the future, especially as more tools become available as AI grows, we can really start to use the internet to expand our minds and, and really help society grow. Do you feel like it's a case where, it's new, we fail first, and then we get better. Yeah. So essentially we're 
we're going through that failure. We're coming out, hopefully, of this failure phase of what we've used the internet for and what the internet has done in terms of its influence. And the next transition will be that people will use it better, do better, see better changes. I think that there's there's definitely a growing group of people who are unhappy with the way the internet is and the superficiality of it. I think it's always going to exist. Like superficial just rises to the top. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, videos, people aren't watching videos longer. They're watching shorter and shorter videos. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I really want to learn on YouTube. It's like, let me see a five second TikTok and watch it 10 times to like, and you have like these gotcha moments where it's like, I got this person on camera. Oh, look at this quote, gotcha. So I think we're heading in the wrong direction in a lot of ways. But I do think that as AI and new technologies come about, like we're literally looking at everything in a little two inch screen. Like that's not the future. Like I can't, I can barely even see, I don't have great vision, but I'm like looking at this thing. That's not the future. Maybe a hologram will pop up. Maybe it'll be something more realistic, but like as technology grows, the more complex stuff I think will allow us to create a lot more stuff. It's kind of mm -hmm. like Dubai. Dubai has grown so fast in the decades mm -hmm. since I've been visiting. Um, and it started out very small. I mean, even more than a decade over the past few decades, but now you're starting to really build based on previous successes. So I think that we're, we're just laying the groundwork for a lot of potential with social media, with the internet and AI, I really think is going to help move things forward. But as you see, like with the Nvidia chips, I mean, there's so much computational power and energy and, um, you need each level of chips to get better before you can progress. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be some breakthrough application, like, you know, Apple Vision Pro. Have you seen like the little visor? Yeah. Do you have yeah. one of those? I don't, yeah. Right? I think they only came out in the States. I was, I literally, so I was, I wanted one and I left like <laughs> literally two days before it started shipping. Yeah. But I also have bad eyes. Like I need like a prescription model oh, and it really? looks stupid. People get like headaches, but that's just starting, right? So like, I think technology has promise, but again, it's, it's getting people on the right track. Mm -hmm. Like if they're not studying now, it's not like they're just going to study all of a sudden. So we need to like, kind of like plant seeds. This is like inception. We need to plant the seed of like actually studying using these new tools. Then people can grow as the technology grows and then their life gets better. And then it's, you know, a rein self reinforcing whole, like, you know, philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. As we're coming towards the end of the podcast, just do some like quick fire questions, especially like for the traders, for example. In terms of uh, the traders, like for someone to not necessarily do exactly what you did, where obviously you had the twelve thousand dollars up to a million in a year, but for those, as you already mentioned, who are starting with the sort of two to five thousand dollar mark, yeah. which is obviously the majority of traders get into the industry, they have that sort of capital. What would your advice be to them? You know, if they've gone to a place where they have the education, they have the edge. What would be your advice to them to start scaling that capital, start to have that longevity? Yeah. So, you know, as my top students prove and I disprove with my laziness and stubbornness, <laughs> create Excel spreadsheets, track all your trades, find where your edge is, size up where your edge is, rinse and repeat. You know, if you're going to make millions of dollars, it's not going to happen on one or two trades. It's going to happen on hundreds, if not thousands of trades. I would never go all in or use leverage. I don't care how great your edge is. Anything can happen. You always have to expect the worst. But if you use a data backed solution an experience backed, you start to think, how can you grow your account into something meaningful? I know that it's hard to think, but two, three, five, even $10,000 is negligible in the long run of your life. So how can you maximize your few thousand dollars? How can you maximize your time to build something that's six, seven, eight figures down the road? So we're filming this in March of 2024. Think about how can you maximize the rest of 2024 and 2025 to set yourself up for something bigger and life-changing 2026, 2027, 2028. Mm -hmm. Most people don't want to think about that. They're just like, give me a hot pick for the next day. And I'm like, no, focus on three years out. What, can, what kind of processes can you put in place, whether it's studying 15 minutes a day, whether it's putting an hour in a day, whether it's you know, building an Excel spreadsheet every day or updating your Excel spreadsheet every day, or even paper trading if you don't have money. It could be, people could be broke. Some people are like, I'm broke, what do I do? Well, save up, work manual labor jobs, but start the process of studying so that you're planting seeds so you can grow and really get better. And then it's rinse and repeat. Over three, five years in, you'll laugh at where you started. This next Sorry, question it's will not be quick fire. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the answer, really, and the value for the traders. But I think this will be an interesting one for you, especially because of your lifestyle. Like you, and you've been doing that lifestyle for a very long time, the traveling and you know, moving around, but still trading. How important is a routine for a trader? It's a double edged sword. Um, a lot of people 
think that it's all about routine, like wake up at 6 a.m., like get in with the sun, get hydration, like work out. For me, trading is not necessarily about routine. The best trades don't come about every day. And if you get too much into a routine, you're like, my goal is to make $100 in the day or 1000 in a day or 5000 a week, you start forcing trades. Hmm. So I think routine can be bad. But I do think it's a good routine to get into studying, to tracking your trades, um, and then being ready to trade when there's a good setup. I always say I'm a retired trader. And I'm only going to come out of retirement when there's a play that's so good, I would feel guilty missing it. And people are like, what are you talking about? Like you trade every day. I was like, yes, I come out of retirement every day. But this little mindset hack where I don't need to trade, I'm not thinking about my daily or weekly goals. Because if you put daily or weekly goals with money, you start forcing trades, you go backwards. Sometimes you even like are backwards, but then you're like, oh, I'm down 2000 on the week. My goal is to make a thousand. Let me bet bigger. And then you bet bigger for no reason other than to hit your ridiculous goals and then you hit it and then you're rewarded for your bad behavior. So you have to watch out for routines and like goals like that. I would rather you just focus on studying, taking good trades. Sometimes a good trade can end up in a loss and being okay with that. In terms of risk, in the Forex in particular, Forex is a huge thing about you, just 1% risk. That's the way it is, 1% risk or half percent risk like every single trade. But from the podcast and hearing other interviews as well and speaking to a lot of high-level traders, they seem to always be suggesting dynamic risk, knowing when to size up. Yeah. You know, and that, that their biggest trades and sometimes the biggest trades of their career come from those trades where they've sized up. What are your thoughts in terms of risk? 100%. Um, I will size up. Even though I'm trading small, it's not that I'm buying a 1,000 shares every time with the same risk and the same plan. I know some trade setups that I take, it's a speculative short squeeze. I'll take like a little gain and I can make like a 1,000 or two. Some of my students laugh at those trades. They're like, don't even do those trades. It's bad. Focus on the big fish. I'll, I like to show everything. Um, the cool thing about trading is sometimes you cannot trade for a week. You might not trade for a month and a solid setup is there. And then you make enough for the entire year. Mm. So it's not like a weekly salary or a monthly salary. It's eat what you kill. And you really have to be ready for those big ones. The problem is most people are not ready for the big ones. If there's a great trade tomorrow, they don't know their size. They don't know their risk. They don't know the pattern. They haven't prepared enough. So I would rather people put in the time with a routine studying every single day so that you're prepared for the big ones and you can see which ones are better than others. Based on your own trading too, there's different better setups. Mm -hmm. Jack just made 150,000 on Fannie Mae. I only traded it once on a morning panic dip buy. I made like 800 bucks. I was very happy with it, it was my pattern. So you have to see that not all traders and not all patterns are alike. You have to really size up for you based on your experience and data. And I would not size up in the beginning. I don't care how great the data looks. I don't care how, um, promising a trade looks in the beginning you should learn to trade small and trade cowardly and then grow over time and then i'm not worried about when people feel like they have to size up most people size up too early mm. so i'd rather you trade really small stay safe get that experience and get that frustration sometimes you're going to be in a trade and you're going to be like i wish i had sized up and a lot of newbies make a thousand two thousand three thousand on a trade and they're like i should have made ten thousand and they're not happy with their small gains mm. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much you make or lose in the beginning. It's negligible. Can you set yourself up for a big trade later on? I had something, but it's gone. It's left me. But so I'm going to ask you a, a question that should be interesting, especially in 25 years. What would you say is the biggest trade you've ever had in terms of profit? Um... I could get philosophical. My biggest trade was trading the career from just a trader to a teacher. And that was my biggest, greatest <laughs> fulfillment and reward. <laughs> the biggest monetary gain, you'll laugh at this. It was actually my worst trade. One of my worst trades turned into the best trade overnight. Um, 2004 Asian tsunami uh, wiped mm -hmm. out a lot of people in a lot of cities in Asia. There was a small company called Taylor Devices. They make earthquake absorption equipment. Penny stock started spiking because... Theoretically, all of Asia would need this earthquake absorption equipment for their buildings to protect against tsunamis and earthquakes. The company is nearly bankrupt, though. So all these rumors said they're going to get all these contracts, but they have no money. Even if they get a contract, where, how are they going to do it? Stock went from like one to six. I'm like, this is BS. I'm going to short it. I shorted big. I shorted roughly 100,000 shares. It goes up to eight, 820. I cover. I lose um, or eight, 780. I lost $180,000 in a day. 
And at the time, it like ruined my year. I was still up on the year, but I was like, this was right at the end of the year. It was like terrible. It kept going. It eventually turned. I reshorted it 100,000 shares. I made back 220,000. So I ended up making 40,000. Worst trade turned into my biggest trade, 220,000. It eventually crashed. I could have made like six or 700,000 over two or three days. But there's a danger in shorting too early, even if you're eventually right. Mm. And I still remember this to this day because I, I took the loss, which I was right to. It, it, I think it went to like 10 or 11. So I could have had like a $500,000 loss. Could have had a $500,000 loss or a $500,000 profit. It's such a like a, a That's swing. That's trading, right? But it's, it's trading based on an event. Mm -hmm. and, and I was I let my greed get to me. I wanted to short it too quickly. Didn't realize the risks. And then I got back on the horse. Mm -hmm. So I don't short sell anymore, um, at least not anytime soon, given the squeezes. In this market, it would have gone from one to like 50 or one yeah. to 70. I would have blown up. So you have to realize there's, there's a lot of risk. Um, and as, as greedy as you want to be, as aggressive as you want to be, just pull back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I can't encourage everyone watching this to trade more cowardly. It's not what people want to hear. But it will really help you understand that long-term success in trading is ultimately lasting and more fulfilling. Yeah. But you need to, like, like the AI chips, NVIDIA is getting more and more powerful chips. You can't get a really powerful chip from the very beginning. You have to go one stage at a time. Trading is the same way. Yeah. Most people do focus on the losses, right? But from what I've understood from speaking to a lot of traders as well, is like their problem, especially the profitable traders, is they normally find problems when they're winning. It's the wins that then usually causes some issues. What, what have you found in your 25 years and then obviously teaching so many traders as well? I mean, there's lessons in everything. The, mm. the best lesson was my $27,000 loss. I still remember it. it. I bring me back to that moment where I just threw away everything. The wins are nice. You know, oftentimes you can go bigger, you can get more aggressive, but I think you learn more from your losers. Mm. And I wish more people talked about their losers. Um, I wish there was like a, a loser day on, on Twitter and you just talk about, <laughs> literally, you talk we'll about- We'll have to make one. You, we should, right? Yeah. You just talk about all your losses and it would be such the most useful day on Twitter. Um, yeah, use this little video. We're going to create loser day and just talk about it because so few people talk about their biggest mm -hmm. losses. They don't want to look like an idiot. They don't want to look embarrassed, but we all make mistakes and it's okay but you can control the mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. You need to learn to minimize your losses. No great trader is perfect. Every great trader learns to minimize their losses. As bad as a $27,000 loss was, it, it didn't, I still finished green on the year. It didn't make huge dent in anything meaningful. You know, up until that point, I actually gave an interview to Humble Trader. I don't know if you follow her. You, yeah. should, you should do an interview with her. That would be cool. And I talked about how I had not lost more than 6,000 on a trade while making roughly 3 million over several years. So if you can not lose more than 6,000 as you make 3 million over years, that's a pretty good risk reward. I don't know what yeah. R that is, but that's a damn good R. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then it's a slippery slope if you forget yourself. Yeah, definitely. No, I love that. And to finish up, I think you'll be the perfect person for this, is directly down your camera right here. You give a 30 to 40 second motivational top tips, your message essentially, whatever you want to tell Ooh. the audience and Ooh. the traders out there. No pressure. <laughs> All right, so trading is fantastic, but it comes with rewards and a lot of risk. And if you don't put in the time to study, if you don't understand the risks, if you don't get disciplined, it can all go away very quickly. So there's huge upside, but there's also downside. Everyone always wants to think about the upside, just like Wolf of Wall Street, but it's like Wolf of Wall Street and Boiler Room, right? No one wants to think about Boiler Room because that's all the people getting scammed and it's sad and it's dark and it's depressing. Everyone wants to think about the glamorizing Wolf of Wall Street and the upside and the, the helicopters and the jets and the chimps and the girls and everything. Thing. You need to understand both sides, okay? Trading can be amazing or it can be depressing. And for most people, it's depressing because they don't sacrifice the short-term fun. They don't put in enough time studying. They don't learn where their edge is. They just want hot picks. They want to follow other people. You need to learn to be self-sufficient. The greatest rewards are not just monetary, but confidence and knowledge-wise. And if you can get so knowledgeable, if you know your trades inside and out, you know your edge, bull market, bear market, crypto, penny stocks, forex, it doesn't matter, whatever works for you. And you have to ask yourself, 
What are you good at? What can you get better at? What are your downfalls? What makes you happiest? How can you maximize your time in life? How can you maximize the markets? How can you learn from your mistakes? How can you learn from your wins? How can you help yourself? How can you help your family? How can you help society? It's all related. It doesn't stop. But this is the most fascinating time in human history where you can learn anything from anywhere in the world, no matter your background, no matter how much or how little money you have, no matter the toxic or negative or bitter people in your life, you can achieve anything if you're willing to put in the hard work, the time and the effort and have patience because the biggest rewards take two, three, five, sometimes even 10 years to play out. So will you have the dedication? Will you understand that this is a marathon and not a sprint? Will you actually thrive or will you prove your doubters and your haters right by being lazy, by being undisciplined, by getting negative and falling down this spiral that too many people go down in trading? Do not go down the spiral. Stay positive. Stay hardworking. You will succeed in the long run if you want it bad enough. How bad do you want it? You tell me. That's what you have to choose. It's not a question of what are you going to achieve right now, this week, this month, this year, but in two years, three years, five years, in 10 years. It's up to you. You can do it. You have the tools. You have the opportunity. Fucking do it. <laughs> I love that. I knew you were the perfect person for the job. Sorry for swearing. <laughs> no, no. Oh, man. Sorry about your table, everyone. <laughs> but everyone at home, take that advice and run with it and listen to it. But thank you. Well, Timothy, Tim, thank you for being here. Everyone at home, drop a comment with your biggest takeaway from today's episodes. We covered so much from trading to mindset to absolutely everything. And there'll be other episodes here, Day Trading Show and uh, past podcast episodes. Make sure you hit subscribe. And until next time, take care.